Romans 12, verse 7. Romans 12, verse 7. Let's back up. Um, the context is, verse 5, the body of Christ. So we being many are one, uh, one body in Christ. So he's talking about the church collectively as one unit. So now verse 7. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that uh, teacheth on teaching. He's saying here's what you ought to be doing as members of this one body. He said if you're job is to be a minister you wait on your ministry wait doesn't mean sit down and be lazy <laughs> it means like a waiter in the you go into the restaurant you have a waiter they should be busy doing whatever needs to be done now you go in a restaurant nowadays and that doesn't happen <laughs> they either are too chatty and you're like shut up let me eat my food or or they don't pay any attention to you you know you been out of tea for 25 minutes and <laughs> that's waiting for Christian we should be waiting on whatever the ministry is God's given us we should be working it serving it hand and foot Acts 20 Acts 20 verse 28 Acts 20 verse 28 he says take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the uh, the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood that's the job of a preacher is to feed the problem in most churches is they've not gotten any food themselves from God so they can't feed anybody in order to feed you have to have an abundance enough for you and enough to pass out you don't you don't want to go up to a food line where everybody working it is anorexic you think what's wrong with this food <laughs> The preacher's got to have a relationship with God or he can't instruct the people in theirs. Colossians 4, Colossians 4, verse 17. Colossians 4, 17. Paul says, And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. That is, there's something to be fulfilled, a, a job that needs to be completed. Um, and now, that's specifically referring to the leader of a church. However, you can spiritualize it for whatever job God gives you. Is There's a mission to be accomplished and we've got to be about it. Romans 12, verse 8. For he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Now these may or may not be different people. Uh, the person who's the minister should also be an exhorter, but it doesn't limit it to just the minister. Everybody should be exhorting one another. Um, and so you'll, you'll find yourself in many of these categories, not just one or two. Simplicity there, he says. That means um, give. Uh, give without overcomplicating it. People can overcomplicate trying to be sneaky about giving. And it produces a bigger show than have they just given. <laughs> it draws more attention. It's like false humility. It goes the other direction, holds up a neon sign, look what I'm doing. <laughs> Simplicity. That means when God provides a way, he provides the money and the means, just do it. Simplicity. There is simplicity to the Christian life. It's easy for us to overcomplicate it. It should not be overcomplicated. We're just servants. We take orders. <laughs> and we do as we're told. Uh, there's three speaking gifts that are mentioned. Prophecy or preaching, teaching, and exhortation. Uh, very few times will you find all three in one person, but maybe. There's four service gifts. Gifts to get busy with. That's ministering, giving, ruling, and showing mercy. Those are all important. Um, and if you're aware of those things, then you'll start noticing when God is moving on you to participate in one of those categories. Romans 12, verse 9. He says, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Dissimulation, that's like um, uh, preferring one over another. It's, uh, it's a, a respect thing. Uh, Galatians 2, Galatians 2, verse 13. 
this disem there's another derivative of this word used in a place you understand it dissimulation Galatians 2 verse 13 this is when uh, Paul comes in to town and he's meeting with uh, Peter and they have a little friendly chat <laughs> Galatians 2 13 and other Jews dissembled likewise with him insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation that is they decided that there's got to be a division here something is not right so your love should be uh, wholehearted not with partiality um, not usually the way that is done is love with a string attached to it <laughs> if you come do this and this and this then you know we'll really love you uh, <laughs> and you'll see it come out in different ways he said to abhor that means to uh, it's it's worse than hate you abhor it you're revolted by it um, or detest the Romans 12 9 he said abhor that which is evil but the don't just abhor evil if you don't move on to the next step you're a grumpy person all the time <laughs> I know a lot of Christians who have legitimate cause to be upset at sin and wickedness but you've got to go the next step to get the right balance the next step is this love uh, cleave to that which is good Grab you something good to replace the wickedness that you see. And that will give you a good balance. A healthy mindset. Verse 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. Ouch. <laughs> he says prefer somebody else over you. Now that's a tough one. Who do you prefer over you? Well it depends on the chore. Verse 11. Not slothful in business. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation continuing instant in prayer distributing to the necessity of the saints given to hospitality these are all practical things that paul is giving here uh, he's talked about salvation and he set all the the uh, dispensation up and now he's going to go through and he's going to say after you're saved here's what you need to be doing get busy <laughs> and he starts giving them here's a bunch of chores that god wants done find out where you fit look at romans 13 Romans 13 6 for this cause pay we tribute also for they are God's ministers attending continually upon the very thing now most of them weren't <laughs> think about it in Paul's day who was it that was taking up tribute the Romans you wouldn't call them very godly <laughs> he said no they're God's ministers for you you're supposed to view it that way whatever you're told to do whatever your task is it's not the man who's doing it it's God impressing on the man now sometimes the devil will get involved in there and that's where you need discernment to find out which one is God and which one isn't uh, he says verse 7 render therefore to all their dues tribute to whom tri tribute is due custom to whom custom is due fear to whom fear is due uh, fear to whom fear honor to whom honor owe no man anything but to love one another for he that loveth one another hath fulfilled the law for this thou shalt not commit adultery thou shalt not kill he's going back to the Old Testament thou shalt not steal thou shalt not bear false witness thou shalt not covet and if there be any other commandment yes there's quite a few <laughs> it is briefly comprehended in this saying namely thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself now the importance in that passage he made plain it's done out of love you could over exaggerate any of those things that he put on the list and still not do it in love so there should be a right heart motive for whatever you're doing um, Romans 12 look at verse 10 Romans 12 10 he says be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love kindly affection that just sounds feminine we got all women here tonight no wonder <laughs> he says be kindly affection that is 
Christians should be kind people. <laughs> Usually, the young Christian is not the one that's kind. It takes some of the bumps and rough roads of this life for you to build a relationship with God. And once you do that, his relationship starts rubbing off on your personality. And God is love. Now I know most Bible believers got their doctrine right, but they don't have their love right. And they want to run around beating people up with it. Now, it's a fact, and you, you need to show them the truth, but you need to do it with the purpose of you love that person. Otherwise, you've just created more, more um, boxers. <laughs> Romans 12, 10, he said, with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Oof. That's given your brother in Christ the first place. Um, it's, a, it's an attitude. Not necessarily you can't do anything. Otherwise, nothing would get done. <laughs> There's something God's given you to do, and you got to get up and go do it. Don't start saying, well, I'm going to prefer somebody else. Y'all go do that. <laughs> now, there's a time to prefer, and there's a time to get busy. <laughs> the attitude, though, is I'm not the end-all, be-all. Uh, Psalm 133. Psalm 133, verse 1. When you go to college, everybody goes for four years or 12 years or 25 years, whatever it is. <laughs> and at the end of it, you're awarded something, a degree. Well, most of those degrees are baloney. You know, um, I'm going to get off on a rabbit trail here. <laughs> Preachers have gotten to where they, they have to carry these titles. A doctor. Well, you're not a doctor unless you go work at a hospital. And I'm not spiritualizing any of that. I mean, literally, go work at a doc as a doctor in a hospital. Then you're a doctor. However, we're not to be many masters. Um, we're not to be called rabbi. Uh, so this idea of I've got some higher position than somebody else's craziness. And so they issue all these degrees. If you go to college, they'll let you pay, or seminary, they'll let you pay for a degree. Or, if you're in the right circles, your buddies will get together and give you one. It's called an honorary doctorate. You'll find, when you look at a book, and it says doctor so-and-so, if it's a preacher, it'll say, uh, the initials behind it, H something, means it's honorary. It's not real. <laughs> he didn't go to school for that. <laughs> so why carry that around? There are some degrees in the Bible that God gives. You'll find one for a deacon. Now, I don't know why no church does this. We don't have deacons, but I don't know why no church does this. The deacons should be awarded a degree from the pulpit. He says if a deacon will do this and this, he earns to himself a good degree. Hmm. That's a biblical degree. So you can use that one. Here's another one. Psalm 133, verse 1. A song of degrees of David. David had him some degrees. <laughs> Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Now you can just almost uh, see that's a picture of David. He was a uniner. Now he was a fighter too. But it was fighting anything that came against his nation. Um, and you're not going to unite the good guys if you're not opposed to the bad guys. So you've got to have both of those. Ephesians 4, 2, he says this. With all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. Forbearing. That's part of love is forbearing. Putting up with stupid stuff. <laughs> Now, I don't mean all stupid stuff. Some stuff you know that they know better than they're doing it anyway. That was Ephesians 4 too. Um, usually what that means is somebody who just does not know or they're not getting the concept. And you've got to go over and over it. God does that with us all the time. You read your Bible through and you see how many times he keeps repeating the same thing over and over. It's because he's forbearing with us idiots. 
Yeah, I don't think you got that. Let me put it in there one more time. <laughs> in Ephesians 5, 21, he says this, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. The sermon that used to be preached all the time when I was growing up was, Wives Submit. <laughs> well, they didn't pair this one with it. The fact of the matter is everybody's supposed to submit to everybody. Now, there should be a reason for it. <laughs> you don't just submit because somebody wants to rule over you. You submit when there's a proper time to do it, but it's an attitude. Uh, Philippians 2, verse 3. Philippians 2 verse 3. In this dispensation, you know how hard it would have been if you were in the Old Testament and had to live under the system of works. If you break this commandment, you must bring the proper sacrifice for it. And if you can't get this one, you go get this one and you come on this day and you do. I mean, talk about a nightmare, man. <laughs> Having to keep up with all that. Well, you know, we've got the same problems. In Yeah, that was their life. Yeah. <laughs> in our dispensation instead of the works and the payment being the thing we've got to fight and work on it's the mind for us it's I, I don't know maybe a bigger chore to keep the mind right as doing works you know it's easy for man to get involved in works because we can become professional at that people can see it and pat us on the back for it <laughs> But that mind, nobody gets to look in there but God. And you know when it's right and when it ain't. Philippians 2 verse 3 said, Let nothing be done through strife and vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Hmm. This is a tough one to do. And I'll show you times it's tough to do. When, you're, when God reveals a truth to you, and you've not found somebody else who agrees with that. <laughs> you should study out, study it out and know between you and God that it is so. But when that happens, the verse is still there. Esteem others better than yourselves. Well, just because you know something is right and somebody's preaching it wrong, that doesn't mean that you say, well, they must be better than me. So uh, I'll just believe the false thing. <laughs> no, there's a time to do it and a time not to. All of these are general attitudes, not specific. You must at all times do this thing, or you'll end up the other direction, backslidden. In 1 Peter 5, 5. 1 Peter 5, 5. It says, Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you, be subject one to another. That is old and young and young and old. And be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Grace is something we need. Unmerited favor. Uh, that's, you, you won't live as a Christian very long before you realize you need that. Something showed up out of nowhere and you need grace. God to give you favor where none existed and you don't deserve any. That's what we need. Romans 12, Romans 12, verse 11. He says, Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Now, what most people will tell you, and I'm not saying it's necessarily wrong, is that this means when you go to work, don't be lazy. Okay, where did he switch off in the context to something secular? Nowhere. He's still referring to spiritual. He's been talking about the body of Christ and your jobs that you participate in as members of the body of Christ. So I think what he's referring to here is the business God's given you to do. Don't be slothful with it. Now, that makes a lot of sense if you read it in the context of what he's been saying so far. Slothfulness is a, a phrase that's used all the way through the Bible, especially in Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs 10, verse 26. He says, fervent in spirit. Fervent is um, a derivative, or we get a, our word fever from that. Uh, that means you're hot about it. You're, uh, you're going after it. Proverbs 10, verse 26. 
as vinegar to the teeth. Ever done that? <laughs> Try that sometime, you'll understand the verse. <laughs> and as smoke to the eyes, so is the sluggard to them that send him. Hmm. <laughs> Ever had somebody you sent on a mission and you needed it delivered by a certain time and they just lollygag and don't care? And you know, He's saying that's what, it, that's what a sluggard is like, a sloth. Um, when I worked at FedEx and the main thing at FedEx is everything has a deadline. Every package has its own time frame that it's got to be off and you're always moving. And when I was in Rochester, I had an alarm clock. And see, you're moving, or I was moving so fast I couldn't keep track of time. And there's so many, they called them priority overnight. A priority package had to be off by 10.30. Well, you're moving so fast, you're not keeping up with when 10.30 is. So I had this alarm click clock that was a woman's voice. It sounded like a woman. Oh, that's just the one they gave me. And it would yell out the time every hour. <laughs> I was on a check ride one day, and my manager was in there. He wasn't ready for this. <laughs> All of a sudden, out of the back of my truck, this woman says, It's 10.30. He <laughs> says, Who you got back there? <laughs> now, that's us as Christians. Sometimes that's why we come to church. Sometimes so that you can hear somebody say, hey, how are you doing with your job? Pick up the pace. That's what Christianity is all about, and we shouldn't be slothful with it. Proverbs 18, 9. Proverbs 18, 9. You'll find these things all through Proverbs as well. He says, when this happens, start looking for this too. He'll give you a couple of steps down the road of a man's character. Proverbs 18, 9. He also that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a great waster. Runs in the family. So a slothful person doesn't care about his time or yours probably is going to be a great waster too. Now all of these things have a balance. You know what the extreme to that is? A hoarder. <laughs> I think that's just as bad. <laughs> you don't want to waste things, but there are things that should go in the waste basket. <laughs> there should be a clear division. In our life, it's the same spiritually. You cannot hold on to every little scrap, and it, here's the way it goes. Usually, a person will take a Bible, and that's their Bible. That's good. You get a personal relationship with your Bible, and you put your notes in there, and then you know what happens? Every time you start reading through, you only see that note. You're re-chewing the same cud for however many years. <laughs> it's good to switch up your Bible from time to time with nothing in it. Now you start afresh and you start hearing things you didn't hear before. Uh, in Ephesians 4, 28, he says this, Let him that stole steal no more, but, let him, uh, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. That's just doing the opposite of what you've found to be wrong. I've often said this. People say, if you ran for the devil, turn around and run for God. No, don't do that. <laughs> that puts them both on the same plane. God is much better than the devil. Whatever effort you gave to the devil, double it for God because he's better. He's saying right here, if a person used to steal, then what he needs to do is get out to work so that he can give it away because he was taken without earning. Therefore, he needs to just give it to people who didn't earn it. Oof. Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12, verse 28. Hebrews 12, 28. He says, Wherefore we, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Now that's where it all boils down to. Your service for God has to be done with reverence to God and fear for God. If you keep those two in mind, whatever you do will be done with the right motives. The motive is, it's not done for me, it's not done for so-and-so, it's done for God, whatever he tells you to do. Romans 12, 12. Romans 12, 12. 
He says, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Now he's telling them this because that's life experience. Uh, life experience is you're going to end up going through some tribulation at some point. And what might be tribulation for you, somebody else would look at and say, that's nothing. But if it's tribulation for you, you know when it's tribulation. <laughs> that's when you pull out the instinct, not coffee, prayer. <laughs> he says, uh, look at uh, 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8. He said to be patient in tribulation. Patient means you're waiting on something. What does that mean? You're waiting for the tribulation to kill you? <laughs> you're waiting for something. You're waiting knowing that the, the trouble, whatever it is, is not bigger than your deliverer, God. And you're patiently waiting for him. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. We've talked about those. And for an helmet, the hope of salvation. A Christian in tribulation should make sure that he's tightened up his chin grip on his helmet. The helmet, that your mind, is the hope of salvation. That hope is not a maybe it will, maybe it won't. I don't know. I hope it will. That's the way people play the lottery. I hope I win. <laughs> That's not the way God gives hope. God's given us hope as a sure thing. He calls it an anchor to the soul. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, he says, Rejoice evermore. So, that hope means that we're patiently waiting for something. Well, in tribulation, you don't feel like being all hip, hip, hooray. <laughs> Well, you're going to rejoice in the hope. In the hope that he's coming back soon. He's getting us out. Tribulation trials will be a thing of the past and never be remembered again. Titus 2. Titus 2 verse 13. The only way you get through patiently is this. Titus 2 verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope. That blessed hope. He's made it a noun. It's a specific thing now, that blessed hope. It's a person. And glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You know what another name for Jesus Christ is? And it only applies to a Christian. He's also known as that blessed hope. One day he'll be here. That's how you get through problems. Is you rejoice in him, that blessed hope. Um, Titus 3 verse 7 he says that being justified by his grace we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life that's not maybe I'll have it maybe I won't no that's the excitement the anticipation of one day we're stepping over into eternal life now that's right there he's talking about salvation and he says this should have been one of the motivations for salvation is there's hope a christian has hope we should have hope in the midst of trials and tribulations all right i was looking for the paragraph mark um but we don't get one do we in chapter 12. um all right we'll pick it up next week at 12 13. Um, Somewhere in there, it changes. Yeah, that's, that's about right. 12, 13, we'll pick up.